kind of focusing on this thought of the beginning of the end. We've been talking about it now for a long time. Throughout Daniel, the, the Israelites are in captivity. In this period of captivity now for close to this 70 year time frame. And it's the beginning of the end. You know, it's the beginning of the end for all season, for the NFL, peak teams are wrapping up this next week. There's going to be a finale to it. And teams are prepared. They've put in all this work and all this time for this big finish, right? To perform well. Daniel here knows that it's time for, for this time of captivity to draw to a conclusion. And what we find through this scripture is how he prepares for this. And, and, and let me just tell you, for, for each one that's here, I, I have no doubt in this. I, you might say, oh, preacher, you're just saying that. That's one of those things you're trying to say to motivate us to do something. But this is the truth. I truly believe this. God has big things he wants to do in and through you. But you have to prepare for it. You have to be looking forward to that, and you have to make preparations to do it. I, I wouldn't be able to go out and perform surgery on somebody. I haven't done the preparation. I haven't had the medical school. I don't have the degrees. I don't have the experience. I'd probably pass out. <laughs> <laughs> and that's something serious. If you're going to cut into somebody's chest or into their head and go to work, that's something serious. Let me tell you what's more serious. Our eternity. The, the souls of mankind and the eternity, where they will spend the rest of their life is far more important than our physical health here. But you know what? We're tasked with being the spiritual surgeons, the spiritual ones that will go out and share. And, and we have to be prepared to do that. And maybe for somebody here today, maybe for multiple people here today, it may even be a step before that. Your big day might be today. The Lord might be preparing you for the step of faith that you need to take. So I want you to look with me today in Daniel 9. We're not going to read the entire chapter. As I told you a few weeks back, the book of Daniel is a little chronologically out of order because chapter 6 that we looked at last week, 7 and 8 came before it, and Daniel had some visions in those, and he shares about those and, and talks about that, and there's some pretty confusing stuff. Daniel's kind of, some of these visions are that way. Then last week we saw him show his faith and, and, and prove his faith even to the king there in, uh, in the Medes of the king of the Medes and chapter 6 as he's thrown into the lion's den. Now I want you to notice what we start off with uh, as we begin in Daniel 9. We're going to read verses 1 through 4. It, it starts off and it says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, in the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books of, num of the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in desolation of Jerusalem. Then, toward the Lord God, to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting sackcloth and ashes and I prayed to my and I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said O Lord great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments now let's pause there for a second because I, I want you to take notice at, at the start of this of Daniel and this great responsibility that's placed before him He's placed with a great responsibility, and you may be there to be here today and say, well, you know what, in the grand scheme of things, I'm just nothing. You know what, that's how Satan wants us to feel. He wants to hold us back. You may say, well, I'm not a preacher, I'm not a Sunday school teacher, I don't have influence over people, but let me assure you, there are people that you have a sphere of influence on that I will never reach. That the person sitting beside of you will never have the opportunity to make uh, an impact on. Each one of us has a big opportunity and a big, more importantly than that, a big responsibility. A lot of times we think serving God is an opportunity, and it is an opportunity, but it's also a responsibility. It's something that is, is asked 
and required of us. It's something God expects out of us. And Daniel here, as he's going through it, tells us that he's reading and he's studying. And it's not just anything he's studying. It tells us he's actually studying the Word of God. He's reading through what Jeremiah the prophet had said and he's become a student of the words of Jeremiah and if you know anything about Jeremiah what does he do he talks about the time period that Daniel and the Israelites are experiencing right now and he tells them about how there's going to be this period this period of 70 years where they're going to be in captivity and it's not by accident that they're in captivity they're there because of the sins of their past because of some mistakes that they made. And, and, and we'll touch on that a little bit in just a minute. But, but what I want you to understand really out of this is without the knowledge of the Word of God, he would have been unprepared to follow through with the plans of God. Did you catch that? Without the knowledge of the Word of God, Daniel would have been unprepared to follow through with the plans of God. And it's the same for us. Today, we can say, well, I've come to church, and I've, I've, I know the Bible stories, and I know this, that, and the other, and, and that's good and well, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't do those things, but until we get intimate with the Word of God and get to know it, we will be unprepared to follow through with the plans of God. Daniel starts to learn and to grow, and he's realizing, you know what, this time is, is coming about, and what does it do in him? It brings this responsibility to light. It brings this responsibility to light. It reminds me of the word earlier as she was preparing to sing. And time is short. We have to take advantage of it. We have to take advantage of the times, the time that we had. And what does he do when he, he starts to realize this responsibility? So he submits to the will of God. It tells us that he set his face to the Lord. He turns his attention to To the Lord God. And then it tells us that he he does a few things. And it shows his dedication and where his dedication is directed. For one, it tells us that he dedicates his his time in prayer. And and really that's what it gets to, isn't it? Why don't we pray more? It just takes too much time. I mean, we've got our routine prayers and we've got our ritualistic prayers. And we may not be one of these ritualistic denominations and stuff, but we still do it, don't we? I mean, now lay me down to sleep. You say, well, we grew past that when we were a kid, but our prayers at night might as well be the same a lot of times. We sit down at the kitchen table, bless the food, bless the meat, I'm a Baptist, let us eat. I mean, that might as well be what we say, right? Because that's the heart behind it a lot of times because we just say the same things. We don't have time to pray. He devotes his time to to serious time alone with the Lord. He also shares his desires because when it talks about his prayer, it also says prayer and supplication. And that's him pouring his heart out to the Lord and and sharing what he feels like he stands in need of and and, and wants the Lord to know his heart. The word supplication actually shows a position in your petition. And, And actually from the root of the word in the Hebrew, it, it, it speaks to not just asking, but begging. Begging the Lord. He shows him his heart. He goes on and he talks about that they also, he also sacrificed. He fasts. Now we hear about fasting, intermittent fasting and stuff, and it's related to diets and, and things of that nature. But fasting was a time of sacrifice. And, and if you've ever went through times of that in your life, truly spiritual fasting. It's not about just, oh, I'm going to show how devoted I am to God and give this up. It's about us sacrificing of ourselves so that we can draw closer to God. Here he he, he sacrificed, and finally it shows us another position of him, and it's a position of humility. He also goes through the process that many other prophets before him had done, and that's he puts on sackcloth and He sits in ashes. Most of the world tells us, you need to try to position yourself to sit on a throne. To to have all that you can have. To have the the nicest car, to have the nicest house, to have everything that, that the world has to offer. 
That's, that's what the world sells us. That's what Satan sells us. That's what he tried to sell Jesus, wasn't it? Back there in the book of Matthew, it tells us that he goes and he tempts Jesus and he offers him the entire world. Jesus turns it down. The Old Testament prophets oftentimes, when they realize the gravity of the situation, when they realize the responsibility that was before them, they, they didn't get up on their high horse and be so proud that God's using them. Actually, you know what? When God wants to use us, it should humble us. They, he put on what we would just think of as like burlap. He got rid of all his fancy stuff. Daniel is in a position of authority. He's one of the under rulers of the king. And he finds himself sitting in a pile of ashes, wearing nothing but this sackcloth. He shows God that truly he knew his place. Sometimes for us, we might need to realize our place in our relationship with God. It's not a privilege when God gets to hear from us. It's the other way around. The final thing it tells us there in verse 4 is that he has this desire to search for the wisdom of the Lord. He continues to call out to him. And he spent this time in communication with God. And that's a key to understanding God's will and his wisdom is to stay in communication with him. If we think back to the brother of Christ, James, he writes in the New Testament. He, what does he say? He says, ye have not because why? Because ye ask not. And ye ask amiss that it may consume your lust. You know what? We're, we're te- generally, we're too self-centered. And too focused on our desires. He says, you have not because you ask not. Now there's charlatans and all kinds of people on the radio and on television that will try to tell you, well, you pray to God, you send in this, you do this. And he wants to give you just the desires of your heart. That's not what my Bible tells me. He wants to give us the desires of our heart when our heart is his heart. And here, James says, you you have not because you ask not. And when you do ask, you're asking wrong. That's why you're not getting... What's right? Daniel, he has the heart for the Lord and he's asking and he's desiring and he's seeking. He, he sees his responsibility, but he knows there's, there's something that needs to take place. Look with me in the next few verses at what it says, We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled. Even by departing from your precepts and your judgments, neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and to the people of the land. O oh Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us, shame of hey, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, who, those near and those far off, and all the countries to which you have driven them away because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O Lord, to you, excuse me, O Lord, to us belong shame of face. To our kings, our princes, our fathers, to the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness that we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of our Lord to walk in his laws by which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. It continues on, and, and for the sake of time, we're not going to continue to read all of what he says there. But, but what is this? It shows us that because of this great responsibility, it brought about genuine repentance. It brought about genuine repentance. If you notice how he starts that off, If you look at verse 5 there, Daniel, listen, if Daniel wanted to do this, you could almost give him a pass. Daniel's just been thrown into a den of lions, right? He's shown how faithful he is. Him and his buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were all together at the start, and those three proved their faith. Daniel set a good example. He's done all these things. He could have said, Lord, you know all those sinners. But how does he start? He says, we. He even acknowledges that, guess what? Daniel's a sinner too. You, you may be a good old boy, good old girl. You may come to church. You may 
do the right things, you may set a good example. You know what? Even at our best, we fall so very short. Why? Because we are sinners. Daniel says, we have sinned. He, he calls out the sin. He talks about the sin. The specific sin, if you want to know why they're in captivity, for years, not, hundred, or not just a few years, for hundreds of years, over 400 years, Israel not practice the Sabbath. Now, I'm not talking about the Sabbath day. I'm talking about the Sabbath year. Back in, in Leviticus, in the law, it, it tells that every seventh year they were supposed to give the land a year of rest and then also do the same on the year of Jubilee, which was every 50th year. And guess what? The Lord knew what they were doing. The Lord knew that they weren't obedient in all things. And, and eventually, as he kept track of it, guess what the total came to? When he said, you're going to go into bondage for 70 years, 70 sabbatical and years of jubilee is why they're in this place. Because they had forgot to be obedient to God. They had rejected being obedient to God. Their disobedience had put them in this place. Now the result of the sin is what? It's captivity. The reality is, each one of us, the scripture tells us that each one of us is a sinner. Each one of us is a sinner. And you know what sin brings? Captivity. Captivity. We're, we're nothing but a slave to it. But Daniel does the one thing that he knows to do. Because see, he's been studying the, the law and he's been studying the Word of God. He had studied even more than Jeremiah. Mercy. So what he said that you were merciful. And he requests the mercy of God and he makes a move to turn away from sin during this same time period right up until the leading into this time of captivity it's recorded in multiple places in the Bible but before this captivity had taken place there was a passage and the last verse of this a lot of you are going to be familiar with, and you've heard it used in this one verse stand alone a lot probably But Solomon says these words in the book of Chronicles, which chronicles all this time of disobedience. See, all this this disobedience is taking place in all this. And it, it says this. It says, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer, and I have chosen this place for myself as a home of sacrifice. What place was that? That was his temple. The temple doesn't exist anymore. Guess what the temple is? Right here. That's where the Lord wants to reside. He doesn't want to reside in the empty shell of a building. He wants to reside in the hearts of his believers. And and listen to what he says. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. He says, you know what? When the Lord causes problems for his people. Now why is he going to do that? He does it because he loves us. He does it because he wants us to get closer to him. And and this is what he says. And you know this verse, you can probably say it along with me. If my people, which are called by my name, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven, or excuse me, and they got turned from their wicked ways. I forgot that part. That's important. Then I will hear from heaven. And I will forgive their sin and heal their land. You know what? We we read that verse a lot, but we forget the first part of it. And and it's good to do those things. But we got to realize, first of all, God is saying, he's sharing this whole passage of Scripture telling Solomon he wants to reside with them. And he wants to reside with us. And you know what? The, The destruction and the problems of this world, they're caused because of what? The sin of humanity. And the change has to take place with his people first. Hey, we can't expect the lost people to change. We want the politicians and and the media, and we want all these people to solve the problems, fix it, end it, whatever the case. We want all this stuff to happen. And the reality is, God expects his people to take the first step. And it says that we have to be willing to do that. Daniel does that. Daniel does exactly what the Lord told Solomon. 
Again, doesn't happen by accident. He comes to this point of repentance. He does exactly what he says, and guess what happens? God responds. The final point. God responds. Look at verse 20. It says, Now while I was speaking, praying and confessing my sin, and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplications before the Lord my God, for the holy mountain of my God, Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you a skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out. And I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are determined for your people, for your holy city, to finish the transgression and to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. What happens? Daniel's in the midst of his prayers. He says, well, he's in the midst of making a supplication. Guess what? There's a command sent out. You know, it's not by accident that Daniel, this man of faith who is sincere in it, that he's doing it the right way, when he prays, God hears. And, And not only does God hear, but God goes about acting on it. God goes about acting on it. Now there's probably a lot of we've prayed and we've prayed and we've prayed for God to act and we feel like He's never acted and sometimes He doesn't act in the way that we see fit. I'm sure Daniel wasn't the first person to pray for this captivity to end. But Daniel knew that the time was drawing near. And he knew that the people needed to change. The reality is that we must prepare for the end and we must prepare as if we're expecting God to act. Here he's he's got this heart of faith and he does it and and what happens? Sometimes God, he he reacts or he acts in unexpected ways. I, I haven't seen many unidentified angels flying around. We don't hear of that too often anymore. But you know what he'll do? Sometimes he may just open a door or close a door for you. Sometimes it may be as simple as he puts someone with spiritual advice in your path. Somebody, maybe it may be that he provides direction to to a a scripture that you need for this moment in time. He he, he might open up an opportunity of a ministry to you. He might rebuild or restore a broken relationship for you. The Lord wants to act in so many ways. And he can do it in a multitude of ways. But we must be prepared for it. Daniel's in the middle of his prayer. Now it gives us this indication that prayer is not just a one of those five minute sit downs. That This is one of those prayers that lasts all day. And he may even be doing some other things in the midst of it. He has this, this attitude of prayer that's going on. He's talking with the Lord. And right up in the midst of it, bust up this angel. As we were going through a Sunday school lesson this morning, I was thinking, I was thinking about all the times in my life where God's given opportunities to to be involved. You know know what I found? And now this is scary. Some of you will walk out here and say, I'm never going to do that. I've heard so many people over the years, first of all, say, never pray for patience. The Lord will will cause a problem, so you'll have to have it. And and I think, man, that's awful. You're going to say you're not going to pray for patience because the Lord might grow you but but here's here's what i found as far as ministry goes if you'll pray for the lord to provide you an opportunity to share your faith i'm pretty certain he'll do it every time i've prayed lord just give me an opportunity to share my faith with somebody i can remember the first time i really was serious about it and i may have told you this before and if somebody was to be listening on the internet and and hear about this and say that was me, then I apologize on the front side. I, I woke up one morning, and I just really prayed, and I said, Lord, just give me the opportunity to, to share with somebody today. 
I drove, got up, had to go to the hospital, visit somebody in Nashville, and, and, and on my way back, got almost home. I mean, I'm, I'm within literally a few miles of the house. And going down 31W there beside where the, the scales are in, in Tennessee before you get to Kentucky, and in front of me, literally somebody's tire blows out. I mean, right in front of me. And you know what the first thing I thought was? Boom, there's an opportunity. There's the opportunity. I, I hadn't had one the whole time I was in Nashville, all this stuff. There's the opportunity. But you know what I've got to do? I've got to be willing to get a little dirty. See, the opportunity didn't present itself in the way I was really expecting or wanting it. He didn't have somebody come to me and say, are you a preacher? I really need to talk. It wasn't that way at all. It was actually in one of the least opportune times. I was going to get out, and I was going to help change somebody's tire. We're sitting in the parking lot there of the beer joint right beside the scales. I mean, this isn't the optimal location to share about your faith. But you know what? The Lord works in mysterious ways. I truly believe he has big plans for us. We have to plan for them. Daniel does that. There's this time that's fixing to take place where the people are going to be granted the opportunity to come home. We're going to look a little bit more about that as we finish up this series next week. But it shows us with that salvation. If you look at verse 24, and that's just part of, of what the angel here shares. But he says that there's going to be an end. That it's going to finish. And he tells them some things that needs to take place. He says, first of all, that they need to make an end of their sins. They need to, to, to bring that to an end. Finish the transgression. And then he says, to make an end of the sins, something needs to be done. Now obviously in that day, they would have made a sacrifice. He, he, he says, to make reconciliation for your iniquities. To, to reconcile the iniquities would have meant a price would have needed to be paid. And he, he says to do all that to bring everlasting righteousness. I want to give you some bad news, folks. We're not able to do any of that. Today, there is no offering that you can make to bring about restoration of God. There's nothing you can do. You can't put enough money in the offering plate as you walk out the door. You can't go perform a duty great enough to bring reconciliation. But you know what? Here's the good news. It's already been done. Scripture tells us, and just as those songs they sang about this morning, that what he's actually talking about here in this passage, and at the very end of verse 24, it talks about is this anointing of, of this Holy One He's really preparing Jesus, or preparing Daniel to prepare the people for Jesus. Exactly what we're called to do, but you know what? You can't prepare others for Jesus until you know Him yourself. When you truly know Him, since He's paid the price, He's poured out the, the sin offering. His blood has been shared, but what does it do? When we truly accept it, when we receive it as our own, it reconciles the debt. It pays it off. It washes it away as if it's no more. Then we commit to live for Him. Are you preparing for the big day that's ahead? Because the reality is, as we'll talk a little bit about next week, there's a big day coming. And that's going to be the day when it's too late. It may be by the expiration of our life, or even more importantly, it might be when those trumpets blast and the Lord parts those clouds. And he calls us home. But we have to be prepared for that big day. Have you made that decision? Maybe today as we rise to our feet, and as they lead us in this song of invitation, maybe there's somebody here today that needs to first make the decision to truly put our trust and our faith in the Lord and, and, and give him our all. Call upon him as our Lord and Savior. And maybe you're here today and you did that a long time ago. But it's time to take that decision and put legs on it to do something about it so that we can set the example that Daniel said. 
you respond as they sing. You respond.